My mission today is to get everybody happy and comfortable with adrenal masses because I think we give too many of these over to the surgical oncologists and, uh, and the endocrine surgeons. So I, I have no disclosure for, um, for this uh, talk. Um, so what I want to do is define the main questions that need to be answered when these patients present to your clinic. We'll talk a little bit about the radiologic evaluation of these patients and then certainly the metabolic and functional workup of, those, of these patients, which I think is what scares a lot of us because there's a lot of these endocrine tests that we, we may or may not feel facile with, but by the end of today, we will. Um, we'll talk about the surgical management, which I think we're all interested in, and then finally just some guideline statements and some follow-up regimens. Um, so I'm clicking two things at once. When we talk about guidelines, you'll, you'll note one thing here on this slide. There is no AUA guideline on adrenal masses, and I think that's interesting. Um, you'll also note that the dates for a lot of these things are quite old, so um, there's nothing really new in this space in terms of how you work up these patients and, and what you need to do to manage them. A quick shout out to Alex Kudikoff, uh, who wrote the only AUA source on this, which is the AUA update, and a good personal friend of my chief resident who I certainly leaned on for this talk. Um, so why us? Why, why urologist and the adrenal gland? Well, I would argue that it's only natural. I mean, we're the surgical experts of the retroperitoneum, as we just heard from Rick. We're minimally invasive surgery experts. Why wouldn't we own this space? We know the physiology. We've been scared about it on enough recertifications and, and board exams. So we, we know this stuff. Um, American is apple pie, uh, adre adrenal surgery for us. Um, what are these adrenal masses? Well, there are one centimeter masses in the adrenal gland, and uh, at, at least one centimeter. Other than that, it's just hypertrophy. And a lot of these are being discovered incidentally with the rise of imaging, as would be for renal masses as well. And in fact, it's about, you know, pretty dramatic increase now, up to 10% of, of CT scans will have adrenal incidentalomas, as they're known, compared to just, say, 20, 30 years ago when it was only 0.4%. So if you're um, referring these patients out or you're not working these patients up, you are leaving quite a bit on the table, um, so to speak. So what are these things? Most of them are adenomas. Most of them are benign lesions. And this is all comers, this top part of the graph here, uh, of the figure. And most of them are non-functional. So true, most of them won't be surgical patients for, for you all. But that does mean that 25% of them will be. And, and you don't want necessarily to leave that on the table. If you look at surgical series, then of course you'll, these numbers will change a bit because these are people who went to surgery, so there's some selection bias um, with that. So what are the most important questions for you to ask yourself when you're evaluating these patients? Number one, does this thing look like a cancer? Does this thing, does the patient have a history of cancer? Because actually 50% of adrenal masses in patients with a history of a primary cancer, actually that's going to be a metastasis. So ask yourself, does the patient have a history of a cancer and does it look like a cancer? And if the answer to those questions are no, then, then if it's an adenoma, is it hormonally active? And once you've answered those three questions, you can manage pretty much any adrenal patient that comes to your practice. And just remember, just because it came to you incidentally, it doesn't mean that it's insignificant and doesn't need to be managed. Um, so what are we trying to do here? We're trying to distinguish between our differential diagnoses, which essentially are, are these entities. You're talking about an adenoma versus an adrenal cortical carcinoma, a FEO. Um, myelolipoma is pretty obvious. It'll have macroscopic fat on the imaging um, or metastasis. And we can use imaging to guide us. So, see, so let's say the patient walks into your office with just a non-contrast CT scan. That might be okay. If you can measure that the Hounsfeld units on that scan is less than 10, you can pretty much confidently call that an adenoma. But if not, then you can lean on some other imaging modalities, MRI with chemical shift, Sounds fancy, but really all it is is an adrenal mass protocol. Your MRI colleagues will protocol that for you. Um, and that in phase, out of phase is that kind of epileptic causing where it's going black, white, black, white. If the adrenal mass drops out of signal, it's an adenoma and you're done. Um, also CT with washout is the most definitive way of doing these things. PET scan we'll come back to maybe just for the rare indeterminate cases. So um, what are the risks of malignancy? Well, number one, look at the appearance. Does it look irregular? Does it have necrosis? Is it involving local structures? 
But truly, the, mo the biggest marker for, um, or the risk factor for malignancy is tumor size. So we, I think a lot of us are familiar with this four to six centimeter cutoff where the risk goes up quite a bit for uh, these tumors being malignant, but this is not very specific. It is quite sensitive. You'll catch most adrenal malignancies that way, but only about 40% of these patients that come in with these sort of giant adenomas are, are actually cancer. Um, so uh, what about growth? Well, adenomas grow, not commonly, about 10% of them grow, and they don't grow quickly compared to adrenal cortical carcinoma, which is a horrible malignancy that grows very quickly. So sometimes even just a short-term follow-up might reconcile that for you. Um, but as you're following these masses over time, you can use the European Society guideline cutoff, which is what I use, which is if they grow 20% in follow-up with a minimum of five millimeters of growth, then you may consider management. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm not advancing one side, but not the other. Um, so are these things functional or not? Remember, 80% of these will be adenomas. And then of those, about 75% of those will be functional adenomas. Um, all adrenal masses over one centimeter need a functional workup. And this is based on multiple guidelines. This is based on a New England Journal of Medicine article. And that's because of these numbers. And really, everybody needs a cortisol evaluation and a catecholamine evaluation. They don't necessarily need an aldosterone evaluation if they're not hypertensive. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, but despite these recommendations, the vast majority of patients don't get this, which means there's a lot of patients walking around with diabetes and hypertension and, and a 1.3 centimeter adrenal adenoma that hasn't been metabolically evaluated. Um, so what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for Cushing syndrome with its typical stigmata. Um, I mentioned a few of those things. By the way, 50% of Cushing's patients will have stones, so something to keep in mind. Um, pheochromocytoma, but also remember 15% of patients with pheo will present without hypertension. So sometimes these patients don't present like the textbook. And then finally, primary hyperaldosteronism which is hypertension and uh, hypokalemia are the biggest markers. Again, not everybody is hypokalemic. So this is, I think, the part that we're most uncomfortable with, which is how do you do this evaluation? Well, it's quite easy. Um, you can do one of three different cortisol measurements and note that one of them is not a spot check of a cortisol level, and it's not an AM cortisol level. That won't get you your answer. You can either do a low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, which I'll talk about. Sounds complicated, but it's not. Um, a late-night salivary cortisol or a 24-hour urine cortisol. When it comes to catecholamine assessment, really plasma-free metanephrines. It's a blood test. Or you, again, can do a 24-hour urine catecholamine assessment. And then if you have hypertension, you can do your renin and aldosterone measurements. Now, how do we do this? Um, I like the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test because it's easy. It's easy for me. It's easy for Valerie, my amazing medical assistant. And, uh, and it's easy for the patient because, honestly, you just give them one milligram of dexamethasone tab and you tell them, take this at 11 p.m. and come in the next morning and get a blood draw. And that's it. And you draw all their blood the next morning. So I just find it to be quite easy. They should suppress. If they don't, I work with a Cushing's expert at Baylor, but you can work with your endocrinologist to do some further testing. Um, for Kahn syndrome, just remember that um, it's hyperaldosteronism. So people focus a lot on the aldo excuse me, aldosterone to renin ratio, but realize that if your aldosterone's nine and your renin's 0.1, you're gonna have quite a high aldosterone renin ratio but the aldosterone's only nine. They don't have hyperaldosteronism. So just kind of keep that in mind. There are some medications that need to be managed around that testing. And if you do test positive, you ought to do some confirmatory testing. About 25% of patients will not localize to the side of the adrenal lesion. And you would hate to pull out the adrenal mass and have that not help you. So adrenal vein sampling, again, sounds fancy, but it's not. It's an order to your IR colleagues. It just says adrenal vein sampling, and they should have protocols for that. And if you need a protocol for that, please let me know. Email me. I'm happy to send that to you. Um, and then finally, plasma metanephrines are just a blood draw. So um, the, uh, I think I'm way behind on that one. Um, 
Adrenal mass biopsy, what's its role? Well, it doesn't really have a big role. You don't want to biopsy an adrenal cortical carcinoma or you, you could cause seeding, and that's been well documented. And you have a 10% non-diagnostic rate, and you have complication rate, pneumothoraces, bleeding. So you really just want to reserve this for patients that are hormonally inactive. Please do your hormonal workup before you put a needle in this thing, because um, if it's a FIO, it will be a bad day. Um, but uh, if it's hormonally inactive and still indeterminate on your imaging studies. Um, this is kind of a busy slide, which is going through the protocol, which I just talked about, and it'll just kind of march you through the, the, the workup. And if they're active, then you go undergo man hormonally active, you go here. If they're not hormonally active, these are some of the imaging studies you can do to resolve them. But when you talk about PET or biopsy, you're way down the protocol down here. Um, so how do you manage these things? Well, laparoscopic adrenalectomy is the standard of care. It's quicker recovery. It's less blood loss. Some of these patients can go home same day, depending on their etiology. Um, and really open adrenalectomy should be reserved for large adrenal cortical carcinomas or, or locally advanced adrenal cortical carcinomas. Um, this is one way of thinking about it. If, if you're worried about an adrenal cortical carcinoma, think to yourself, is there a local invasion? Can my general surgeon do a laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy? Am I going to be able to get my laparoscopic colleagues to help me? If not, then you probably ought to consider doing open surgery. If it's big, you probably ought to consider doing open surgery because there might be a cult invasion. FIO. This is kind of how I always feel when I'm about to start a FIO. Um, it's quite delicate, um, but I think just to review the perioperative management of pheochromocytoma, um, you want to make sure you got your alpha blockade on board. I personally don't like phenoxybenzamine, which is the test answer, but uh, it's irreversible, and so hypotension post-op is a little bit difficult to manage, so I prefer um, the briefer acting ones and the reversible ones. Um, remember, beta blockade is only after you have alpha blockade on board and only if you have arrhythmias. I really like metyrosine. Um, this is something that I think that Rick turned me on to, and uh, it decreases the cortisol production. Uh, so it kind of, excuse me, a catecholamine production leading up to surgery. So it can kind of prep the patient for what it's going to be like. It's a little difficult to get, but if you can get it, I think it's quite helpful. I like to pre-admit them for IV hydration. Unless they're perfectly stable throughout the procedure, I like to put them in the ICU overnight. And yeah, I may discharge them from the ICU the next morning, but I like to make sure they're very closely watched. Remember to communicate with your anesthetic colleagues when it comes to your adrenal vein management, and then realize that 10% of these reoccur and 20% or so of these are familial, so it does take some perioperative counseling. So this is a patient of mine with a 10 or so centimeter uh, FIO. On the right side, I tend to lean on robotics, especially if they're large. If I make a hole in the vena cava, it's nice to be able to sew that hole up with some facility. And this is kind of the uh, slightly, this is the SI setup. The XI setup is a little bit different, but this is what that would look like. Um, and this is just the quickly the steps of the procedure. I tell the, the residents to start like you're a liver surgeon. Get the liver retractor in, incise the peritoneum, and just start getting that liver up. Work it up until you're above it. And then once you do that, work your way back to the vena cava, kind of substantial vena cava here. Um, and then when you get there, try to find your posterior lateral adrenal vein. It's actually my assistant um, dissecting that out. You can secure this with a vessel sealer. I find on the right side it's a little depending on how big your mass is, can be a little bulky and blunt, so I think ligature can be nice. Here I do what I don't often do, which is uh, I'm clipping it um, just for illustrative purposes, and you transect the adrenal vein. Develop your plane between the adrenal mass and the upper pole of the kidney, and once that's developed, elevate it and just get it out of the fossa. You start seeing your know, psoas muscle back here, and then here's your mass, and there's your clean fossa. We, we know how to do this procedure. It's pretty straightforward for us. Um, on the left side, I lean towards less uh, because we do so many single site donors, as Rick alluded to. And so for us, it's kind of, you know, just what we do. Um, and, and so this is a typical incision for a last adrenalectomy.
What about adrenalectomy in big cancer cases? I thought if you had an upper pole mass that's pretty ugly, you ought to do an adrenalectomy. Well, actually, that's not true anymore. Really, the only role for an adrenalectomy in an RCC is if it's abnormal on imaging or if maybe you have some locally advanced features that make you think like it could be involved or you kind of just want to get left side out sort of thing. Um, and so this person's got kind of an ugly upper pole tumor, but more specifically, they've got some adenopathy here. And so this one might be one I might consider getting the whole left side out just, just because. But I think in these cases where I have big renal vein thrombuses that thrombi that go, you know, kind of across the midline, and these are very, you know, complex, uh, you know, laparoscopic and robotic procedures. Sometimes for these, it's just easier to get the whole thing out. So these were both uh, um, robotic procedures that we did. So follow up for the benign mass. So now we're back to that mass that's in your clinic. And unfortunately, sorry, didn't come to surgery, wasn't hormonally active, um, didn't have features of metastasis. So what do you do? You follow them. There's a low risk that these things will convert in some series, but in other series, there's a pretty substantial risk that they may grow or have metabolic activity. And these are generally more common in masses that are three centimeters or bigger. So what most advocate for is annual hormonal workup and intermittent imaging and depending on what society you look at you'll see various regimens but in general annual um, hormonal testing which you're all familiar with now and then an annual imaging study to make sure you're not growing and um, if you look at uh, Alex's nice AUA update the, he kind of walks you through the steps here which is do you think it's cancer if so do some functional workup and get it out if you think it's not cancer do a functional workup. Is the functional workup positive? Confirm it. If so, get it out. If it's not functional, follow it with some intermittent imaging and, uh, and lab work. So uh, I'll just kind of uh, speed up the conclusion just so we can move on in the session and just say, we can all do this. Um, we, we can own this sector. We don't have to give it over to the endocrine surgeons. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them as you get into the adrenal space. And thanks so much.